Hello class. Today we are going to start talking about communism. Um, and we're going to look at the philosophy of communism and some of the basic terminology that goes with communism. This lesson is the first in a series that will focus on the philosophy of communism, not on what communist leaders um, actually did once we started seeing governments be created that called themselves communist. Because um, there is going to be a pretty big disconnect between what communist philosophers wanted and what we actually see happen in the world. And so to understand that and to understand why people thought communism was a good idea, why it was attractive, to individuals, um, you first have to understand what it actually is, which is something that um, most people really can't do, actually, especially in the United States, where um, people have been taught that communism is bad. Well, they're often thinking of what happened in the Soviet Union or China or North Korea. And while you by no means have to like the philosophy of communism, you do, uh, I really do want you to understand what it is arguing for and what its main ideas are so that you can understand why some people do find it to be an attractive philosophy, why there are still communist parties even in countries that aren't communist states. Like there are European countries that have communist parties that win votes every year. Um, and why would that be? It's probably hard to understand if you're thinking of just what dictators like Stalin um, did. Whereas if you understand what the philosophy is actually arguing for, it can give you a new insight and maybe new ways of thinking about the world you live in. So um, communism gets developed in the 1800s after the heyday of capitalism. Um, and unrestricted capitalism. And that's because it's going to pitch itself as an answer to the problems of capitalism. And so we have spent time for this reason um, looking at what happens when you have an unrestricted capitalist society or as close as we've ever come um, during the 17 and 1800s and the issues that crop up with that. Um, what sort of problems exist for people and why would they want those problems fixed? And so that's what I want to start with is a review of what were the problems we saw with unrestricted capitalism. Hopefully um, things are coming to mind like the disparity between the rich and the poor, um, how the wealthy are able to get very wealthy but on the flip side of that you have the poor getting very poor and destitute, living in really terrible conditions, um, needing their children to work in factories because otherwise they can't afford to feed them. You see the development of, um, instead of having our class system, which is where we sort of started, moving into a caste system where the family you were born to um, pretty much decides where you're going to end up in life. Um, you see the rich uh, basically controlling the government. So these are um, the major issues that most of the people in capitalist countries and around the world are going to be suffering from because a lot of them will be being controlled by capitalist countries. Think again like Britain um, taking India as its colony, right, and for profit and, and for capitalist um, motivations with their with their economies. So you're going to see a lot of people suffering under um, a capitalist mentality of profit seeking um, countries and businesses. And so it shouldn't be surprising that you're going to have ideas about how to fix this um, and how to help the majority of the people come about. And the most um, radical one of these is going to be communism. So we need to look at communist thought. Right. Um, as again, as I said, a reaction to unrestricted capitalism. The philosopher that creates this philosophy is a man named Karl Marx, and he is a German philosopher. A lot of people think he's Russian because the first time we're going to see an attempt for a government to put into practice this communist philosophy is going to be in Russia, which will create what we call the Soviet Union. Um, but Marx was not Russian. And I'm making a big deal about this because Marx, as you'll see as we go through these lessons, was not even thinking about Russia as a possible place for a communist revolution or a communist state. He was thinking about places like Germany and Britain. Um, and we're going to look at why that is. But for Marx, the idea of having a Russian communist state at that point, I mean, the early, late 1800s, early 1900s, which is when Russia actually has its communist revolution, would seem crazy to him. Okay? So he's a German, and he's thinking about Germany, he's thinking about um, Britain, these industrialized places, which Russia is not industrialized. 
So uh, Marx, he's the creator of communism. And for him, he's asking the question, okay, what's wrong with capitalism? Because he's looking around Germany, a highly industrial society, and he's seeing the wealthy are doing quite well, but the masses of people, the majority of people are doing very badly. Um, they're poor, they're hungry, they're, you know, they're living pretty miserable lives. So the question is, okay, what's wrong with capitalism? We're seeing this, we're seeing this happen during a period of unrestricted capitalism. What is the problem? Why is capitalism causing these problems? And his answer boils down to the word exploitation. His answer is the big problem with capitalism is that workers are being exploited. Now, you might have heard this term exploited before. Um, you, people use it uh, in common language, um, meaning generally being taken advantage of, getting the bad end of a deal, not being treated fairly. And those are all accurate definitions for the word exploited. But I want to give you a heads up that um, Marx himself is going to have a very specific definition in mind for what exploitation means. Um, it does incorporate being taken advantage of or being not treated or not being treated fairly, but he's going to have a very specific definition that I do want you to be familiar with, and we're going to work our way towards this definition over the course of the next couple slides, okay? But so for right now, the big problem with capitalism, according to Marx, is that workers are being exploited, right? So first, let's look at who is exploiting the capital, or so who's exploiting the working class? And who's exploiting the working class? Well, the wealthy, that's the obvious answer, but again, this lesson is we're really focusing on vocabulary building here. So in communism, the word for the wealthy, we're going to use the word bourgeoisie, okay? And it's spelled, it's got like an extra R in there that you don't actually pronounce. So it's bourgeoisie, okay? Bourgeoisie. Now, what is the bourgeoisie? It is the capitalist elite, right? The class in a capitalist society who own most of society's wealth and the means of production. Now, this is your official definition, and I need you to try and hold on to that in your head. But we're going to come back to a definition for means of production in a few minutes. Okay? So right now, I just want you to have that in your brain. First, let's look at the first part of this. The class in a capitalist society who owns most of society's wealth. So when we're talking about the bourgeoisie, right? We talked um, a couple lessons ago about the very wealthy that came about in the era of unrestricted capitalism. Um, the John D. Rockefellers, Vanderbilt, Carnegie, um, Morgan, really, really wealthy people. I said J.P. Morgan was so powerful and so wealthy that he actually bailed out the U.S. federal government. Um, that's how much money he had. So now some of these guys are, are self-made men. This kind of idea, the idea of, again, um, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, that American idea. Um, and that was true because we had this sort of opening in society. But once they got, um, once they set up their companies, like Rockefeller creates his oil company, and then he manages to squash all the competition, create a monopoly, and prevent other oil companies from really taking hold. Um, so there's this opening that's very brief in our graph from going from like everybody starting out at the same point to some people winding up on top and some people getting stuck on the bottom. And that's not even true for all of these guys. Some of these guys came from wealthy families and so they had that advantage. Obviously, some of them had education and, and other, you know, con social connections that helped them out. Um, but regardless, they wind up at the top, okay, um, very extremely wealthy. And um, can you think of any examples of people today that would count as the bourgeoisie? You got your Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and then these last two here are our Koch brothers. Okay, um, actually one of them has recently passed away. Um, Jeff Bezos's net worth is 145 billion dollars. Right, Bill Gates 102 billion, Warren Buffett 71 billion, the Koch brothers over 40 billion. So when we say the bourgeoisie, we're not just talking about the wealthy generally. It's a very specific subset of the wealthy. They, they're the wealthiest of the wealthy. They are the top of the top. Um, to figure out if you or your family would be the bourgeoisie, ask yourself this question. 
if I, or since most of you are teenagers, if my parents, okay, were to stop working tomorrow, how long could my family survive without them working? And if the answer is indefinitely, meaning like for a really, really long time, for the, for like for generations to come, we would be fine. Then your family is part of the bourgeoisie. If your family has so much money that it could just stop working and it could just live off of investments, it could live off of other people working on things it owns. So say your family owns an oil field and you own that oil field and other people can just work it for you and you still make the profit from that, then you're part of the bourgeoisie. And my inkling here is that most of you probably are not. Um, if your family would eventually run out of money, I'm not talking about like your grandparents saved and now they have some money to retire, but like that that's not the same thing. It's It could last generations and your family would be fine without working. Then that's part of the bourgeoisie. So, um, for example, if you think of the family who owns Walmart and Sam's Club, the Waltons, they make uh, about $4 million every hour because of their businesses and their investments, right? They don't need to be working in the store anymore. They can just let other people like run the company and they would still be making money um, and lots of money. So to put this into context, because again, it gets, it's like mind boggling when you start talking about millions and billions of dollars, these are numbers that kind of just lose meaning for people. I'm gonna give you some comparisons, okay? Um, according to the Federal Reserve, so according to the US government in 2014, the median household income in the U.S. was $54,500, about, okay? Now, we're going to compare that to a million dollars and a billion dollars, and then we're going to compare that to our lower end of the bourgeoisie here, these two at the end, the Koch brothers, um, net worth about $40 billion. Okay, so average family income. $54,500. If instead of dollars, we turn that into seconds, 54,500 seconds is equal to 15 hours. So not quite a whole day, right? That's the median household's annual income in units of time, 15 hours. A million seconds is 11 days and 12 hours. So that's a pretty big difference, right? A million seconds, 11 days and 12 hours, average household income, 15 hours. Okay. A billion seconds is 31.6 years. So the difference between a million and a billion, you're looking at 31 years. Now, we've talked about this before, but now I want to actually add in some actual people here. So we've got the Koch brothers, $41 billion. In seconds, 41 billion seconds is 1,296 years. So we go from the average family's income is 15 hours to their worth is 1,296 years. 15 hours to 1,296 years. So when we're talking about the wealthy here, I mean, you, people often don't have that in their in their heads when they're debating about taxes and how much should you tax the wealthy. You know, they have the sense that the wealthy, yeah, they're doing better than us average people, but, um, you know, not so much better. And so sure, it'd be nice to be them. And, and so you shouldn't tax them too much. But like the degree of difference here is quite stark, right? And, and this is the same in the 1800s when we're looking at Rockefeller and Vanderbilt and, and et cetera. So if you wanna do this in, in another way of looking at it, I'm still with time, right? But let's say you just, you had a billion dollars, okay? You win the lottery or whatever, you have a billion dollars and you take a time machine back to January 1st of the year one, right? And you take your billion dollars and you burn a thousand dollars every single day from January 1st, year one, up through today, you would still have over a quarter of a billion dollars left right now. Right? So you're burning a thousand dollars a day for 737,451 days. 
and you are winding up with still over a quarter of a billion dollars. That's how much a billion dollars is. So then when I say um, Bill Gates has $102 billion, right? Or Jeff Bezos has $145 billion. Like that amount of money, it is impossible for a single human to spend that much money, right? Bill Gates does a lot of charity work with his money. We've talked about this. Um, and he still has all of this money. So that's the level of wealth we're talking about when we're talking about the bourgeoisie. We're not talking about the upper middle class. We're not talking about people who make $100,000 a year. Um, we're talking about the really, really wealthy, okay? All right, so these are the people that Marx says are exploiting the working class. How are the workers being exploited? Now that we know who is doing it, how are they doing it? Okay, well, what's the point of capitalism? Every capitalist is going after what? What do they want? They want profit. Where does profit come from? Well, profit comes from your revenue, right? Minus your cost equals profit, right? So let's look at what this means um, with a nice little chart, okay? All right, so I'm actually going to, uh, we're going to make a sort of mind experiment, um, si sort of simulation here. Let's imagine um, we have a factory owner named uh, Bob, and I'm going to exit out, um, yeah, we can do that. Um, we've got Bob, okay, and Bob owns a factory, and let's say the factory, normally I'd ask you what you want to make, but let's say this factory makes um, one of those, the sneakers with the wheels on them, right? Sneakers with wheelies, okay? Great. All right, um, and uh, Bob owns this factory, and each pair of sneakers that the factory makes, um, Bob sells for $100, just to make the math easy. So I've drawn here this diagram, this bar, okay, and divided it up into 10 sections, and each section here is worth $10, okay? And so in total, this bar represents the total value of a pair of our wheelie sneakers. All right, everybody with me? Okay, so um, we've got Bob in the factory. We'll say we have Sally who works in the factory. She helps make the sneakers, right? Okay, so if Bob and Sally are going to make these sneakers. Bob controls the factory. He doesn't actually do any of the work, but are making the sneakers itself. That's Sally's job. But what, what do they need to make these sneakers? What sorts of things do you need to make the sneakers? Um, okay, so we're going to need rubber, right, for the soles of the sneakers. We're going to need plastic, which comes from oil, um, to make the wheel and those little, like, uh, what are they called, aglets on the end of the, the shoelace. Uh, we need cotton for the shoelace itself and some of the, um, the material for the actual shoe part, right? Um, you might need, uh, let's see, canvas for the shoe itself. Um, you're going to need dye, right, to make the shoe, the, the cotton a cool color so people want to buy it. Um, Okay, so that's like our raw materials. Oh, you're going to need, um, let's say, steel because you need to like screw in the wheel right into the shoe. So you'll need metal, probably steel. Um, you might need like aluminum or something for the little like um, eyelets where the holes, where the, the shoelace goes through the hole. All right. I, okay, so there's our, there's our raw materials. Um, we're also going to need... Um, a place to make these, right? So you're gonna need the factory building, right? Um, you're going to need uh, land to put the factory on, um, electricity, um, you're gonna need machines, okay? Machines, um, that's a typo there. Um, let's see, okay. You'll probably need some like running water, you know, bathrooms and things like that for your for your employees. All right. Um, Okay, pretty good, pretty good. Uh, and then obviously you're going to need, you know, um, like Sally, you're gonna need people, right? You're gonna need people. Okay, I'm gonna put them in a separate list over there. Okay, so um, those are the things we need to make our sneakers. Great, okay, so let's see. Um, if we're trying to calculate our profit and we're selling, we are selling our, um, our shoes, right, for $100. That's what we're selling each pair of shoes for. 
Well, and then in order to figure out our profit, we have to figure out how much our cost is right here. Okay. Um, so what is our cost? Well, how much do you think these, um, these raw materials uh, cost per sneaker? Um, let's say they cost like $5 per sneaker. So like half of one of these. Okay. And then let's, uh, let's switch our color here, um, to green. Okay. Um, how much do you think these cost? Uh, the factory electricity machines per pair of sneaker, right? Let's just for, to make the math easy, we'll say that's another $5. Okay. So all told, let's go to blue here, all told all these things, okay, cost 10 bucks per pair of sneakers. These things are what we call the means of production, okay? We'll come back to that. But these things, so $10. We also obviously need the person who's actually going to put all this stuff together because otherwise it's just a pile of cotton and rubber sitting next to a machine, okay? So we need our labor. Um, how much do you think Bob is going to pay Sally per pair of sneakers? Uh, let's say he's really generous, okay, and he pays her $10 per pair of sneakers, okay, and that, that's actually a lot, but we'll say $10 per pair of sneakers. In the real world, that's not how much people get paid per pair of sneakers, but we'll just say it, okay? So if we add that up, we've got our $10 from our raw materials and machinery costs, plus our $10 of labor per pair of sneakers, so that's $20 total, right? So our... Um, total profit is going to be $80 per pair of sneakers, okay? So Bob gets all the rest, let's see, we'll get purple, all the rest of this is profit for Bob. He gets to keep it. He could reinvest it in the company, he could, you know, go buy a yacht, he could roll around in a big pile of it, whatever he wants. It's his money, it's his profit, it's his company. Um, but this graph is supposed to illustrate how the workers, in this case Sally, is being exploited because Bob is not doing any of the actual labor here. He's not putting the sole of the shoe with the canvas and lacing up the sneaker or dyeing the fabric. He's the head of the company. Um, so he sits back and he watches his laborers do this work. But he gets $80 per pair of shoe, whereas Sally, our worker, only gets $10 per pair of shoe. Okay. She's making so little that she can't even afford to buy a pair of shoes. Because that $10, right, it probably takes her at least a day to make a pair of shoes if she's doing this all by herself, right? Um, then she probably can't even afford to buy a pair of shoes that she spent all day making. Because she's got to eat with that $10 or feed a family or pay rent or whatever. So why is this possible? How is this possible? Because this is what Marx is saying is exploitation. The wealthy are getting all this profit when the workers are doing the labor, but they are not actually getting the benefit of all this work. The benefit is going to these, um, these owners, these wealthy owners. That's what Marx is saying when he means exploitation. Why is this possible? How is this possible? Because some of you are probably thinking, well, like, but of course, this is how business works. This is this is how this works. Sally's just the worker. Bob owns the company. Well, why? Why is this possible? And the answer to that has to do with these things, right? Um, who owns these things? Bob owns them, right? So Sally is doing the work, but she's using Bob's cotton and canvas and dye and aluminum, and he's paying for the electricity, and he bought the machines, and it's his factory. So without Bob, Sally does not have anything to work on, right? But of course, without Sally, Bob just has a pile of materials. So Mark says these things, these things in blue here, the red and green, they are the means of production. And I told you we would come back to a definition for that, okay? Means of production are everything you need to create a new product except the human labor, okay? So 
anything you need. It could be seeds or metal or coal or oil or diamonds for the drill bits or machines or the building itself or roads and electricity. Whatever it is you need to make something, that is considered means of production. And then labor, the people working on those things, that's what creates the products themselves. Labor acts on means of production. So labor is not a mean of production. And we said that the bourgeoisie, right, are the people, if we back up here, right, the bourgeoisie, by definition, sorry, are the people who own most of society's wealth and the means of production. And they are able to own most of society's wealth because they own the means of production. Because Sally doesn't own those means of production. Because Bob owns these things, that's why Bob can pay her such a low wage of $10 per pair of, of sneakers, right? So the, this is how these things go together. The wealthy are wealthy because they own these things, and therefore they can hire people for very little money because these people need jobs, they need to feed themselves and pay rent. That is why this system works the way it is. And the, it's designed to do this because capitalism is all about maximizing profit. You want to cut your costs as low as possible, which means getting the cheapest rubber you can get, but also paying your workers the least amount of money you can pay them and still have people do the job so that you make your profit the biggest it can be. Right? And in the real world today, people make far less than $10 per pair of shoes when they're making shoes. Okay. okay. So... That is the means of production, the bourgeoisie. I said that Marx had a very specific definition of exploitation. Because what is exploitation? It's taking advantage of people. But for Marx, he's very specific. When he says exploitation, he fundamentally means that the workers do not own what they make. And that is what is um, the result of the fact that they don't own these means of production. Sally doesn't own the sneakers she just made because she made it with things that she did not own. So even though she made the sneaker, Bob owns the sneaker because Bob owned the things that went into making that sneaker. Okay? So for Marx, his definition is a very specific definition. Exploitation ultimately means workers don't own what they make, and to him, this is the root of all the problems in capitalism. If the problem with capitalism is workers are exploited, and the exploitation means workers don't own what they make, well, why don't they own what they make? Well, because they don't own the means of production, okay? And so the root of the problems in capitalism, the workers not owning what they make, this is why they can be paid so little. Because they don't know what they make, they have no control over who the sneaker gets sold to, or how much is charged for the sneaker. They have no control over how much money they make as a result. Because Bob gets to decide to sell this for $100 instead of $50 or $200. Sally has no control over what color the sneaker should be, how much it should be sold for, who, should it, who it should be sold for, or what happens to this profit. She doesn't get to say, I demand to be paid, you know, half. I should be paid $40. Um, for this product, for making this product. She has no control over any of that because it's not her sneaker. If it was her sneaker, Marx would say, then she could decide to sell it. She would have total control over it. This is how people used to be when they would make stuff in their home before the Industrial Revolution, right? You would make your, you would weave your own fabric, you'd make your own shirt, and then you could decide who to sell that to, and you could keep all the money that you made from that, and so you could make sure you made a living wage. But that is not what is happening anymore, because it's an industrial society, and workers now have to use the machines that are expensive, so they're owned by people who have enough money to buy these machines, so now they do not have any control over the things that they make. It's not their sneaker anymore. Therefore, they can't control what it's sold for. They can't control the amount of money they make as a result. Right? Um, all right. I used to tell a funny story about a teddy bear, but I uh, don't have time for that right now. So we are going to just kind of wrap this up by looking at how exploited the workers are. Okay. Not only do they not own what they make, but as I already said, they can't even afford to buy what they make. Um, this is actually the origin of where like kilts become so popular in Scotland because there was an Englishman who owned a pants making factory um, and he was paying his workers so little that he realized they couldn't even afford to buy a pair of pants which they had spent all day making right 
because pants cost money. Like it takes labor for the whole trouser leg and the fabric and the trouser leg, etc. So he decided to have to open up a second factory to have some of his workers instead make kilts, which are basically skirts, right? And so there are fewer there's fewer stitches that have to go into it so they can be made faster. And there's less fabric because it's it's not going down the whole leg. It's just basically a, it's it's a skirt. So um therefore these would be cheaper and so the workers in the pants factory could afford to buy the kilts the workers in the kilt factory still couldn't really afford to buy the kilts um but that's like marx is looking at a society in the 17 and 1800s where you have workers spending their entire lives making products that are so they're being paid so little that they still can't afford to buy the product that they're making right and then later this will become actually a symbol of scottish pride um and they'll be putting all these like different patterns on them to represent the different clans and whatnot but ultimately the popularity of kilts comes from um from exploitation and then the need for national pride to resist against this exploitation all right so um i want to just play a video for you where you can look at this in a modern day um, and this video, while you watch it, it's about um, cacao farmers in the Ivory Coast, the Cote d'Ivoire. You're going to need to read the subtitles because it's in a mixture of French, because the French colonized the Cote d'Ivoire during the colonial period. And even though the French no longer control the Cote d'Ivoire, they left behind the legacy of the language and other things. Um, and, and it's also in um, Flemish because it's a, it's, a, um, uh, it's a Flemish production that's actually recording this and... and, and um, putting it out for people to see. So you're gonna have to read the subtitles. But while you watch this, I want you to be thinking, how would Marx describe these workers? What vocab word that we covered today would he use to describe what's happening? And um, the workers are gonna say it's a privilege to taste uh, what they're making, which is the chocolate. What would Marx say to that? Okay, so here we go. Avec une production estimée à environ 1,6 million de tonnes, la Côte d'Ivoire est le premier producteur mondial et exportateur de fèves de cacao, un ingrédient qui rentre dans la composition du chocolat. The cacao is a milliard of business, die de wereld verdeelt in sloepers en in sloepers. Wij Westerlingen hebben de luxe om van chocola te kunnen genieten. Maar die luxe is hier in die voorkust bij cacaoboeren zoals Unda en Volse ver te zoeken. Je suis en train de chercher un peu de cacao. Vous voyez, ça là, tu laisses un cola. C'est dans là, je n'ai rien eu. Et puis, plus de cacao là aussi, c'est pas menti. On sait pas comment faire. Alphonse est un de 700.000 kleine boeren, werkzaam in de Ivoriaanse cacao teelt. Hij oogst en droogt de bonen, maar hij kan er zelf geen chocola van maken. Donc, on est, on est, on est, avec là, les fèves là, est-ce que vous savez ce qu'on a fait? En tout cas, non, je ne sais pas comment on prend un cacao là même pour faux. Unda verbouwt al jaren cacao, maar heeft dus nog nooit chocola van dichtbij gezien. Het enige wat hij doet is zijn bonen afleveren bij de tussenhandelaar. Maar nu hij ervan geproefd heeft, is hij meteen zo enthousiast dat hij vindt dat al zijn vrienden het moeten proeven. Chocolade is nauwelijks verkrijgbaar in die voorkust. Bovendien is het daar relatief duur. Een chocoladereep kost hier 2 euro per stuk. En Alfonso verdient maar 7,50 euro per dag. 
Van dat geld moet hij 15 gezinsleden onderhouden en betaalt hij vier arbeiders. We zijn op de kleine plantage van Oendaal Fonds. Hoe druk bezig is om samen met zijn arbeiders de rijpe cacaovruchten te oogsten. Zo begint iedere reep chocolade als een bergje bonen op een bedje van bananenbladen. Maar ook hier op de plantage blijken de arbeiders niet op de hoogte van het verdere verloop van de wereldwijde chocoladeketen. Alors le cacao est ce que vous qu'on a fait On plante le cacao, nous on ne sait pas ce que le cacao est comment fait. Alphonse Lane, le, le cacao, alors les gens l'utilisent pour faire le, le chocolat, le mesa, mm -hmm. le cacao. Non, c'est mangé pour les francs. Mm -hmm. C'est ça qui s'appelle chocolat. Mm -hmm. Le cacao on prend pour faire. Ndiamo, il y a un cacao à vous. Okay, so how would Marx describe these workers? What vocab word would he use to describe what's happening? He would say the workers are being exploited because they do not, they, they've never, they don't even know what's actually being done with the beans that they are um, cultivating. Uh, one of them, if you saw, thought that wine was made from it. Um, they sell these beans to companies that make a lot of profit off of them. They're sending the beans to factories in um, Europe to, be, to have the chocolate made there. Now, this is a review question from last unit, but why are all the factories in Europe? That's the legacy of colonialism, right? Um, colonial powers were coming to Africa, India, the Americas for raw materials and then shipping them back to their home countries to turn them into products and then sell those products to their people and the people in their colonies to make a profit. Um, keep that in mind because as we look at Marx's criticism of capitalism, that'll come up once again. Um, the workers say it's a privilege to taste the chocolate. What would Marx think about that? Would he think it's a privilege? No, again, he would say that the workers should have control over what they're making. They should be able to, at the very least, afford to buy the chocolate. Um, which they can't do. If you caught the, some of the numbers there, um, these workers are making do, they're supporting um, extended family members with very little amounts of money. So there's no way they can afford to buy these chocolate bars, even though they do eventually get back, ship back to the Ivory Coast where they could, you know, they're there, they could buy them, but they don't have the, they don't have the money to do so, even though they are an integral part of making the chocolate bar. Okay, so um, that's just a modern day example of something that Marx would very likely have an issue with. Uh, we are going to um, next time look forward to, or move forward in our discussion of communist thought. Um, and we're going to look at whether or not um, this system Marx would think is a natural way uh, for people to live their lives.